I often get asked about the Christian landscape in America. What are these different denominations? How many Christians are there and how should we understand different religious groups? In the next few minutes, I'm hoping to give the outlines of an answer. A couple notes before we start though. One, sources are going to be in the footnotes below. Two, I'm going to do my best to be impartial. Certain groups have strong feelings about each other, and almost all of them have strong feelings about their own correctness. I'm going to do my best not to step on any toes, but I can't make any promises. In addition, I'm going to have to be very brief. I don't have the time to give these topics the attention they deserve. And last, I'm focusing on Christianity in the United States. We'll say a few things about global Christianity, but that is a much bigger and more complex topic. That said, here's the plan. First, we're going to discuss the history of Christianity and where a bunch of the subgroups that are within it come from. And then, we'll say a few words that broadly classify these groups in our world today and understand their representation in the 21st century world. Let's start with the earliest Christians. As the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection spreads, debates start to emerge within the early church about topics like Jesus' relationship to the Father and his deity. As consensus positions were reached within parts of the church, what emerged was the first divisions among those who identified as Christians, the division of orthodoxy and heterodoxy. Orthodoxy was made up of those Christians who agreed with the earliest creeds and their consensus formulations of how to understand these issues. Heterodoxy represented divergent views, which, while we won't spend a lot of time on them right now, are important to understanding the church's history. While many heterodox positions like Arianism have largely disappeared, at least in an institutional sense, a few of them still have influence on certain modern strands of the church. Monophysitism, for example, is in the background of the Coptic and Syriac Orthodox churches, and Nestorianism was responsible for planting churches in India and other parts of Asia, some of which still exist today. That said, what we had then was orthodoxy. And orthodoxy was closely linked with the Roman Empire, and as that empire split in two, east and west, so too did the orthodox tradition. This gives us what we today call the orthodox churches and the Roman Catholic Church. While those two groups didn't finally officially separate until 1054, over a debate about the Holy Spirit, they were functionally separate long before that. This was somewhat a result of language and culture, and also somewhat the result of a debate about whether the bishop of Rome, who we now call the Pope, should be the boss of the whole church. The East said no, the West said yes, and what emerges is the first big split within orthodoxy. Let's focus on the Catholic side of that then. Some things do happen within orthodoxy, but for a variety of reasons, especially the rise of Islam and the shift of many Christians in the East to minority status, the basic tradition stays the same, but not so in Catholicism. There were always factions and tensions within the Catholic Church, and one could see a conflict between established clergy and monasticism, for example, or between more traditionalist and humanist impulses. But these traditions maintained union within the larger church until, in 1517, a monk named Martin Luther nailed some protests against indulgences to a church door and started the Protestant Reformation. Early in the Reformation, we see three strands emerge. The first is Lutheranism, largely in Germany and influenced by Luther and his successors like Philip Melanchthon. The Reformed tradition was the name for the Protestant movements in other parts of Europe like Switzerland, the Netherlands, and the French Huguenots. In England, the Reformation started with the rise of Anglicanism. We know it in America as the Episcopal Church when King Henry VIII declared the English Church as independent from Rome. Lutheranism largely does its own thing, historically speaking, although it certainly still exists today. But then coming out of the Reformed and Anglican worlds, we see many of the diverse denominations we recognize in the modern Protestant landscape. This is also where things start to get complicated. So coming out of the Reformed world, we're Anabaptists, so-called because they were against the practice shared by Catholics, Lutherans, and other Protestants of infant baptism. They also represented a more radical push for change than many of the early Reformed found desirable. As those controversies played out, the Continental Reformed world also influenced those in England who were unhappy with the state of Anglicanism. What resulted was called the Dissenters, or Puritans, several allied groups working to, as they saw it, fully reform the Church of England. These included Presbyterians, who thought all churches should be ruled by groups of elected elders, Baptists who were partially influenced by continental Anabaptism, and Congregationalists who wanted congregations as a whole rather than elders or a church bureaucracy having authority. Jumping ahead a century and a half or so, and this is where chronology is also going to get fuzzy for the sake of clarity, we also have the rise of Methodism flowing out of the revival started by the Anglican John Wesley and his friends, including the influential preacher George Whitfield, which is where things really explode. So coming out of Anabaptists are traditions including the Brethren, although the name has later been used by some groups coming out of other arms of the church, and the Amish, both characterized by their commitments to pacifism, among other distinctives, and more recently the Evangelical Free Church, 
Looking at the dissenters, what is known as the Holy Miss Movement arose in part out of Presbyterianism through the influence of Charles Finney and others, and ultimately gave rise to groups like the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Some Baptists, who thought the Sabbath should really still be observed on Saturday, and that Jesus was coming back very soon, broke away and founded the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The same Holiness Movement that we mentioned in Presbyterianisms spawned Baptist offshoots as well, the most notable today of which is the Church of God in Christ, which is also noteworthy for being the largest of what are called the historically black denominations. More on that in a minute. Some Congregationalists, feeling that they needed direct communication with Jesus rather than mediated through the institutional church, became Quakers, and other Congregationalists, through a series of mergers with each other and other Reformed groups, became the United Church of Christ. Coming out of Methodism, although not exclusively from it, the American revivals of the 19th century see a number of groups arise that were influenced by Wesleyan and holiness thinking, including many, but not all, of the groups calling themselves Churches of God and Churches of Christ, as well as the Church of the Nazarene. Also arising in some of these same circles was the beginnings of the Pentecostal movement of the early 20th century, which held that we should expect the manifestation of spiritual gifts like tongue speaking and miraculous healing in the present day, just like the days of the Apostles. And this gave birth to numerous groups, the largest of which is the Assemblies of God. And while I'm going to catch my breath a little, there is a bit more to say about that. First of all, that is still an oversimplified history, and lots of groups have been left out. Second, those waters are muddied even further today by the fact that not only are almost all of those groups still active, but we also encounter many so-called non-denominational or independent churches in the U.S. While these churches are often of a similar theological strain, evangelical, congregational, usually dispensational, they are not a part of any larger denomination and can vary dramatically from individual church to church. And third, there are also significant offshoots of Christianity in the modern day that don't fit into any of these categories. The the largest are probably what are called the non-Trinitarian Restorationist churches, all of which in one way or another disagree with that consensus of orthodoxy we talked about back in the early church. The two largest groups that would have this classification are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who are often colloquially called Mormons, and Jehovah's Witnesses. So what do we make of all that? Well, first, while that chart is confusing, it is worth noting that despite all of those different groups, we shouldn't overstate the differences. Usually, the splits that caused them resulted from debates over one or two specific doctrines, while there was a huge amount of common ground. And in addition, some of the divisions are really the results of ongoing cross-pollinization between groups. What's more, many of these groups have grown and changed substantially since their founding, oftentimes becoming similar to other groups. So how can we make sense of all of that? Well, let me offer a simpler classification for the religious landscape today, one that's used by many who study Christianity in America. So starting with Protestantism as a whole, people often divide it between mainline Protestantism and evangelical Protestantism. Mainline Protestantism includes groups like the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, United Methodist Church, American Baptist Churches, Presbyterian Church USA, and the Episcopal Church. Evangelical Protestantism includes groups like the Southern Baptist Church, Church of Christ, Assemblies of God, Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, and the Presbyterian Church in America. You might notice some overlap there with Baptists, Lutherans, and Presbyterians on both sides of the divide, and that's because these categories aren't attempting to describe the historical differences as much as they are attempting to describe two modern ways of approaching Christianity. What are those ways? Well, this is going to be a little complicated. Often people unhelpfully summarize the difference between the two groups as being liberal for the mainline and conservative for the evangelical side, and emphasize that in a way that overlaps with politics. There is some broad correlation there, especially with those self-identifying as evangelical, leaning to the right, but that isn't the point of the classification, and it has some problems. In the first place, that can vary a lot denominationally. For instance, Anglicans in America actually lean pretty heavily Republican, while Seventh-day Adventists, a very evangelical church, tend to vote Democrat. It also varies historically. A hundred years ago, some of the most prominent evangelical leaders were the ones strongly advocating socialism, while many leaders in what would become the main line were upholding the social status quo. There are instead two other impulses that this distinction is really trying to make. The first is cultural. Whether modern culture's challenges are something Christians should accommodate, which is more the mainline view, or oppose, which is more the evangelical view. And the other is theological. Mainline Protestants have tended to hold many historic Christian beliefs more loosely than evangelicals, who have strongly argued that they need to be upheld. If you can't tell, though, the border there can be a bit fuzzy. But it does describe a set of impulses that do help in understanding modern Christians. That division is also helpful as we talk about modern Christianity more broadly. 
So besides Protestantism, Catholicism is still a major factor in American Christianity. While not split into denominations, though, many Catholics have those same two impulses at work today, causing challenges within their fellowships, with more progressive Catholics conflicting with more traditional ones. One other denominational group that deserves a special call-out as we talk about the modern landscape in America are what are called the historically black churches like the Church of God in Christ, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and the National Baptist Convention. There's some irony in the naming, of course. We don't call Lutherans or Episcopalians historically white, despite the fact that they are statistically less diverse than many historically black churches. But many of these groups are ignored, even though they occupy an important and interesting place in the Christian landscape. While the boundaries are again fuzzy, these denominations tend to function politically and socially in the ways one would expect more from mainline churches, while being pretty evangelical in many of their theological impulses. And one more label that's worth highlighting here, which has already been mentioned once, is Pentecostal. It's a term that pops up and often crosses denominational lines. Most Pentecostal denominations are either evangelically Protestant or historically black, but there are churches within the mainline, and even within Catholicism, that identify with the movement. Two more questions you might have. First, how big are these groups? First, let me introduce two more categories from non-Christian religions. One is other, meaning people who identify with a non-Christian faith like Islam, Judaism, or Hinduism. And in addition, there's the category of unaffiliated. This includes atheists and agnostics. About a third of the unaffiliated have those views. But it also includes many Americans who identify as having no religion in particular, but still hold various spiritual beliefs. Here's the population breakdown in the U.S. from the Pew 2014 Religious Landscapes Survey. 14.7% of Americans are mainline, 25.4% are evangelical, 20.8% Catholic, and 6.5% are in historically black churches. Another 5.9% of Americans have other religious views, 2% are Jewish, 1% are Muslim, and then there are other smaller groups, and 22.8% are unaffiliated. It should be stressed that this is about self-identification. There are plenty of people in all of those categories that aren't especially observant on the one hand, and a surprising number of the unaffiliated who attend churches or other places of worship on the other. But those numbers have been changing, and that's probably what's most interesting about them. Here's how they changed since 2007, the last time before 2014 that Pew did its survey. Evangelicals and historically black churches declined slightly. Catholicism took a steeper hit, and one that might be even worse than the numbers show. Some demographers note that part of why the decline isn't steeper is because immigration patterns heavily favor Catholics. The main line shrunk by almost 20% in just seven years. And alongside that, the unaffiliated spiked dramatically rising by 70% in that same period. Other religions are also growing in the country as it gets more diverse, although they are starting from smaller absolute numbers, and so they are still relatively small in an absolute sense. One last factor. Like we said, this is focusing on churches in the U.S. And that can be misleading. Our idea is sometimes that Christianity is dominated by North America and Western Europe, and there was a time when that was true, but not anymore. Here's the actual global distribution of Christians. 12% of the world's Christians are in the U.S. and Canada. Another 26% are in Europe, although that even that is a bit misleading. By far, the largest chunk of those come from Russia, with other Eastern European countries also contributing large numbers. Another 25% of the world's Christians are in South America, and 24% more in Africa. Asia is somewhat less, with 13%, although it's also worth noting that that number is complicated by China, whose official state opposition to independent forms of Christianity makes it notoriously difficult to measure. And all of that means that as much as it's valuable to understand Christianity in America, to really understand the landscape of Christianity, we have to go beyond the United States. Indeed, the typical Christian in our world today would be non-white and from the Southern Hemisphere. This global diversity continues to drive conversation and change throughout the church.